Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, John Cena is the bull that doesn't want to fight, named Ferdinand. Ferdinand, voiced by John Cena, may be an enormous and very strong bull, but he doesn't want to hurt anyone, spending his days sniffing flowers as an oversized pet to Nina, voiced by Lily Day. When Ferdinand goes to a flower festival and is stung by a bee, accidentally causing mayhem, he's captured and sent back to the ranch he escaped from as a calf. Ferdinand is determined not to become chosen to compete in bullfighting and sets about trying to break free once more and return home to Nina. The book, The Story of Ferdinand, was first published in 1936, written by Munro Leaf, and although it is a piece of children's literature, it very quickly found favour with adults as well, as well as appealing to both boys and girls who related to Ferdinand's character equally, as well as the book's themes of pacifism, and it soon became a popular classic, so much so that it's never been out of print. Only two years after the book was first published in 1938, Disney had already adapted it for the screen in the form an animated short called Ferdinand the Bull, which actually went on to win the Oscar for Best Animated Short. Now, all these years later, we have a feature-length version, simply called Ferdinand, which takes the fairly slim story and expands it massively for this film version, which is a very loose telling of the story. It comes to us from Blue Sky Studios, who are the creators behind Ice Age and Rio. In fact, the film comes from one of the main creators of those movies, Carl Sendana, who is the director here, as he directed several of the Ice Age films and both of the Rio movies. And I have to say, I'm not a fan of Blue Sky's output. I've reviewed several of their films on this show in the past, and while technically I think their animation is absolutely superb, I find their scripts are really not aimed at adults. They're very simple, very much aimed at kids, which is why I find them to be the weakest out of the major animation studios if you compare them to their rivals at, say, Illumination, DreamWorks, and especially Pixar. But who knows? Maybe I'll like this one. Maybe Ferdinand will become just as beloved as the tale it's based on. But I find that unlikely. If there's one thing the movie gets right, it's the casting of John Cena in the title role. I know I've been quite critical of Cena in the past, especially in his earlier films where he's very stiff and uncomfortable, but he has gradually relaxed as he's appeared more and more, and he seems certainly a lot more comfortable when it comes to comedy. That seems to be where Cena's element really lies, I think. And I think the casting of Cena in this role on the face of it, may seem fairly unorthodox, given, you know, he is a wrestler. But when you think about it, Cena makes a lot of sense, especially when you consider that Cena has a very young fan base. When it comes to his off-screen persona, he is a bit like Ferdinand in that he's got this quite big, muscular frame. But underneath it, he seems like a gentle, very sincere and very lovely to his fans, and it seems like it's that side of Cena that they were trying to channel when they cast him in this voice role, and to Cena's credit, that charm is all over Ferdinand. He is really affable in this movie. He's really pleasant. He's actually genuinely funny. He delivers the lines solidly. It's exactly what you want from the casting of this character, but the the placement of Cena in this movie also works on another level, I think, in that you have this very masculine figure playing the role of Ferdinand, who is ostensibly a pacifist, and yet it plays into the idea, which is the heart of this story, in that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, that it's okay to be different. That's what Cena's presence does, I think. It reassures younger viewers that it's okay to not conform to what other people's expectations are of you. That is why the story has endured for so many years. When Ferdinand, the movie, takes that approach and sticks with it, particularly in the opening and the closing section, which are the closest 
to the story that it's taking inspiration from, it's then when it's at its strongest because it takes those ideas and expands upon them. There are definitely aspects in Ferdinand where you could infer a commentary on ideas of masculinity and expectation, particularly because of the violent world that the calves are growing up in, in the shadows of their fathers who are all competing to be in bullfighting, most notably Ferdinand's father. But you have the other calves as well who grow up into the other main characters, most notably Valiente, who's voiced by Bobby Cannavale in his adult form, but he also um, voices the father, and the father, he's very dismissive of his son, and his son is the biggest bully out of all the young bulls there. And so what you get is this sort of circular idea that it's ingrained in the bulls from childhood that they have to be violent, they have to be competitive, and they have to assert themselves. But Ferdinand rejects that concept. He goes completely against it, and once he realises how destructive it can be, and how vaguely toxic it is, he breaks free from it, and in doing so, he goes in search of a new family, of a new surrounding, that would actually support the way that he thinks and the way that he sees the world. And that is certainly a concept that is broad enough that I think that many kids will relate to it. That's the power of this story. And it's proof that if the filmmakers wanted to, they, they had a rich emotional texture there that they could tap into because that could be interpreted by viewers as being analogues to many different things. We have these conversations with Ferdinand where he's talking and he's saying that weird is the new normal. It could be expanded to a number of different things about growing up, about finding yourself, and it's the most frustrating thing about Ferdinand is that they're not completely invisible, they just don't utilise them. But instead, by the time the second act rolls around, the movie has completely lost sight of what it wants to be. Once it moves into that middle section where Ferdinand is returned to the ranch and he's brought back to the bulls that he grew up with, it's then the movie just smothers itself in endless comic relief characters. And if you've seen a Blue Sky movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It seems like they're all in competition with each other to see who can be the most irritating. I mean, imagine if you're a kid, you might find some of these amusing, but if you're an adult, you'll just be rolling your eyes the entire time. There is a list of characters in this movie and top of the list is Kate McKinnon as the so-called calming goat, Lupe. Now, McKinnon's a performer that I'm very hot or cold on, in that I've liked her in some things, but it really depends on her direction. I think that she likes to play weird and exaggerated, and I, do I think that works well in sketch comedy. It doesn't work well in film. And in this movie, it seems like, well, you're playing a character called Lupe, so just go completely wacky with it. So she just goes all over the place throughout this movie. I think she's ad-libbing a lot of the time, She's just throwing out one-liners and being really over the top, and it's just exhausting. And it's made even worse because this character, she assigns herself the role of being Ferdinand's coach, even though Ferdinand doesn't want to be a bullfighter, but she's trying to encourage him, and she's ostensibly the, the sidekick throughout the entire rest of the movie, but she does nothing! Like, the character just hangs around without doing anything to serve the plot, which just makes it even more glaring that the comedy for this character just simply doesn't work. Like I said, there's so many other comic relief characters because she's not the only problem here. There's numerous characters that exist solely for one joke that probably wasn't even funny in the first place. David Tennant plays a Scottish bull named Angus, 
So we get to play up all the Scottish jokes and he says things about wearing kilts and the only other joke that character has is that he has an overlong fringe so he can't actually see things properly. That's a real waste of tenant in the part. I mean, he throws himself into the whole, into the, all the Scottish jokes, but really it just seems like an example of, of the movie really doing a lot of well, let's throw in a Scottish character. Let's throw in some German horses. We'll get to them in a minute. Which is really bizarre for a film that's ostensibly meant to be set in Spain. I don't think it does a very good job of embracing the culture apart from the bullfighting element, with the exception of several uses of the Macarena. This is the kind of movie that has Macarena jokes in it. That's related to a toy that some hedgehogs want, some hedgehog thieves, called Una Das and Quatros. No trays. Trays is apparently out of the picture. Uh, Una is voiced by Gina Rodriguez and Quatros is voiced by by uh, Gabriel Fluffy Inglesius. And you can tell because they give him all the fat jokes. I love cake! And he appears to be doing an impression of Josh Gad. And then there's the aforementioned German horses who are total snobs. And every time they appeared on screen, I was annoyed beyond belief. They freeze the movie cold. They are just the worst as they come on and say lines in a terrible accent like, Spoiler alert! Or lines like, Let's hagen das and make up! or something along those lines. Either way, it had the word hagen rammed into a sentence that I guess was an attempt at a pun? It doesn't even make any sense. It, what? What does that even mean? This is probably a candidate for one of the worst attempts at punnery I've ever heard in a children's movie. So with all of that competing against each other, you can understand why, as an adult viewer, I was very, very against this movie. But you know what? That's fine. It's clearly aimed at kids, the very youngest end of its audience. And sometimes there are little individual scenes that do work. The film's best comedic moment happens fairly early on. There's a sequence where Ferdinand finds himself in a china shop. And so we we get this fairly lengthy little comedy bit where he tries to sneak his way out the other side and tries not to break anything. That moment has a lot of really great physical comedy, but so much of the rest of the movie is dreadfully mediocre. Considering that this is supposed to be aimed at children, I don't think they'll find this very interesting either. The whole middle portion of this movie is clearly padded out and very dull. It's biding its time until Ferdinand makes his escape attempt. And I think that kids will pick up on that. They'll notice how desperate the attempts at humour are. There's a sequence in this movie that, like many in this film, plays upon Ferdinand's size in that he has to sneak through a house quietly, and to do so, he puts on rubber kitchen gloves, and they start making fart noises as he steps on the floor. Oh yes, we're that desperate to raise even a chuckle. It's the kind of movie that realises that it's hit a slow spot, so it reverts to dance sequences not once, not twice, but several times. There are several sequences that just turn into dancing. Like, come on, really? Are we that threadbare? But what really surprised me to the point of bewilderment is just how dark Ferdinand is in places. Admittedly, that's somewhat unavoidable given it's a film aimed at children about bullfighting, a notoriously cruel sport. And yes, they handle a lot of it euphemistically, but even so, it's fairly unambiguous that there is a clear off-screen off fatality level going on right from the prologue where Ferdinand's father very, very clearly dies. I mean, obviously they don't show that on screen, but it's made very apparent, yeah, he's not coming back. And later on, Ferdinand realises just how much of a, and I quote the movie here, 
death sentence it is to be selected. Really, this is the kind of movie that has the looming spectre of death sort of playing out in the background. It's very strange, and I know the movie, you know, it's very much pro-animal rights, it's very much has that in its favour, and of course I support that, but even so, it's very awkwardly handled in this movie. They don't do a great job of trying to handle the tone of that particular concept, which is made even worse by the fact that they add an additional level of threat to the proceedings, because this ranch that they're on is literally in the shadow, practically, of a giant meat processing plant. That's right. Remember, every time something wacky happens on that ranch, meat factory looming over them. There are scenes where bulls are loaded up in trailers that are going to this meat processing factory. The trailer door is shut and it has a printing of a bull on it, but it's all cut up into meat outlines. That happens. Um, there's another sequence in this film where there is a big hijinxy set piece as they try to escape a meat processor. Oh yes, that happens in this movie. I'm not kidding. This genuinely is way out of place. They, I have no idea what the heck they were thinking. And so what we have with these characters is an environment where they either face being selected for bullfighting, where the film makes very emphatically clear they run the risk of being stabbed through the brain with a sword, or they literally end up as meat. Like, it's, they're, either way, they're going to end up dead. Like, that's a, that's a really horribly fatalistic theme to have in a film ostensibly aimed at children, and I don't think the filmmakers have realised quite how subtly horrific the whole thing is. There are other problems with Ferdinand. The confrontation between the bull and the matador tries to go for an emotional heft that simply isn't there, and that's partially because the relationship between Ferdinand and Nina is totally undeveloped. She leaves the movie at the end of the first act, and even though this relationship is supposedly crucial and should be this driving, motivating force, she's barely in the rest of the movie. But the real problem is that instead of aiming for a great movie that they could have potentially made with this story, they've settled for mediocrity. And quite frankly, with the level of animations that we've had in recent years, that's simply not good enough. It shows where Blue Sky really falls short in telling these stories. And instead of trying to make something great, they've stopped to smell the roses. It's not bull, it's also not terribly good either. Ferdinand may have his heart in the right place and a likeable voice performance from John Cena in the lead, but this is another weak outing from Blue Sky Studios. While there are hints of a potentially rich and emotional film with ideas of masculinity and being different, it's smothered by the studio's usual slapstick from numerous comic relief players that border on the obnoxious, particularly Kate McKinnon's wacky goat Lupe and a bunch of inexplicably German-accented horses. The film feels light years behind the story's rival studios like Pixar are and DreamWorks are telling and only aims for the youngest end of its audience, but even they'll find the middle section drags and parents might be alarmed by the strange fatalism all throughout. The story Ferdinand is based on is a beloved classic, but this is forgettable at best. If you like this review, then charge on over to my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early, among other perks. But until next time, I'm Matthew Burke, fading out. Hey.